The Oklahoma Sooners get not just one, but two commitments on Wednesday to the 2025 recruiting class. We're going to discuss that and so much more on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150. Win or lose, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Elmer. You can follow him on Twitter at JoshOnRef. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on the KREF Sports app. And Josh, off the top, it is recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. And all of our segments here on the Locked On Network on recruiting are brought to you by LinkedIn. Go to linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And why are we talking recruiting? Because the Oklahoma Sooners double dipped on the recruiting trail in 2025, getting two commitments, one from four-star cornerback Malik Hawkins, the other four-star defensive lineman Trent Wilson. So let's start with Malik Hawkins. We'll go chronologically here because he committed first. And every time I go watch Malik Hawkins, and I said this on our social media accounts, I love the way that he plays the cornerback position. He plays with a tenacity, a ferocity, a physicality, an edge that you love to have on the outside because, man, that is a that is a lonesome position to be playing out there. When you're out on an island, every time the ball comes towards you, you're the you're getting all the attention. But if you have an if you play with an edge and you play with a tenaciousness and an attitude a lot of times that gives you that confidence to be able to go out there and make those plays when the ball's up in the air and it's you versus the wide receiver you don't have any safety help there's nobody you know able to to cover up any kind of mistake it's just you i'm excited about this commitment i know that there's out you know people out there that want to diminish it because maybe he doesn't have a rating at, at certain recruiting services but i love the addition of malik hawkins to the 2025 class yeah, he's got uh, really good size. Uh, I, I like the, you know, defensive coverage, leverage, and positioning uh, that he plays with. Seems to have a a nice understanding there. Uh, PBU City for uh, Malik Hawkins. He's busy in that regard. And uh, if you say that, uh, you know, the recruiting rankings not great here or there. Well, Rivals loves him. Rivals has uh, Malik Hawkins as a four star, as the number thirty two corner. In the 2025 class, which look, uh, that's on the fringe, right? According to their, you know, rankings right here of being a, a draftable uh, NFL draftable corner. And obviously, you know, you move up 10 spots in that regard or 15, 16, whatever it may be, right? And uh, you are a drafted cornerback by the time uh, everything's all said and done. Number 55 player in the state of Texas, which, of course, is uh, going to turn your your head every time you hear that. And then, you know, the Arkansas, Houston's, Indiana's, Mississippi State's, the world that you want out over and the recruitment is good. So uh, the uh, the Hawkins brothers, you got one already in tow, and we felt good that uh, Malik would be following uh, Big Brother's uh, trek to Norman, but now, uh, obviously, you know, that is indeed the case. So big time get. Yeah, pretty low key commitment or recruitment at least uh, to get Malik Hawkins. Another one that was kind of, has kind of been pretty low key as well as Trent Wilson. This is one that you know the offer didn't come not that long ago uh, from Todd Bates and Brent Venables and the the Oklahoma Sooners coaching staff. And not long after he spent a little bit of time in Norman, I mean the needle got moved and all the recruiting projections, a flurry of them, came through favoring the Sooners. Trent Wilson is a really really intriguing defensive line prospect. I I like the way he plays again. This is a quick twitch, kind of a defensive tackle who gets up the field really quickly, is able to shoot the gap, 
penetrate and get into the backfield and make plays also plays with a lot of physicality too. He he's one that's going to hold up at the point of attack. Obviously you're going to want to add a little bit more size to him if you want him to play on the interior, but he's got the frame to be able to do that, to bulk up like we're seeing a David stone bulking up right now in his first off season with the Oklahoma Sooners. So again, a, a defensive tackle that's in the blue chip variety as Todd Bates continues to overhaul this defensive line from the previous regime. I think he's done a great job with that. And then adding a Trent Wilson who Oklahoma got him over Penn state and Ohio state, a number of big 10 ACC sec schools that were in pursuit of Wilson, uh, another big time blue chip prospect addition for the Sooners. So here's a recent scouting report, just bits and pieces of it from Cooper Patania of uh, 24 seven sports. They, uh, they love a lot of what he's got going on. Six foot eight plus wingspan suggest he maintains the growth potential to add an additional 20 pounds to his frame at the collegiate level. Uh, quote, a quick twitch, explosive prospect. The Henry Wise standout flashes the ability to win with his first step, initial quickness at the point of attack, while displaying some natural power in play strength to move opposing offensive linemen off the line of scrimmage, end quote. And they say that he projects as an interior defender at the next level. Todd Bates, uh, I saw my man uh, was tossing some messaging around. And, oh, by the way, that was shared on the Instagram of one Trent Wilson uh, after he announced his commitment to Oklahoma. So Todd Bates clearly was a big factor in this recruitment for OU. And, and these, again, you know, look, uh, broken record, broken clock is right twice a day. I got gotcha. you. But Trent Wilson is the type of defensive lineman that Oklahoma has over the years been trying to find and in a lot of regards sorely lacking but we were told with Brent Venables with Todd Bates with Miguel Chavis they were going to start to on a regular basis find these types of players and Trent Wilson again is that kind of dude yeah and it's you know by my tally that's like the fourth interior defensive line prospect that's a four star or better you had Grayson Halton, then you had Jaden Jackson and David Stone, and then now Trent Wilson, a, a part of that. And Kamari Moore, part of the 2025 recruiting class, could grow into a blue chip player as the rest of the cycle goes on. Uh, what's intriguing now is we're, we're going to talk about another quarterback in the 2026 class. We've talked about Darian Coleman. We've talked about some others that Oklahoma has been uh, in pursuit of or been at least attached to. Well, they just hosted Jaden O'Neal, a quarterback prospect out of California, four star in, in certain places. This kid has got something to him. They hosted him over the weekend for an unofficial visit, and apparently that moved the needle so much that they're the leaders, according to what he told on three. He said, I had a blast at the University of Oklahoma. They were there were sorry, there were many things that stood out to me, but the one thing that stood out to me is the passion the coaching staff has into developing their football players on and off the field. They were very genuine and real people being on campus and talking to the staff. I can relate to them. I'm looking forward to continue building the relationship. The comparison is unmatched and Oklahoma just set the new standard. The only few schools to be close were, were UCLA, Miami, but I still need to unofficial visit those schools. Now, this is a kid with 24 offers from across the country, West coast, East coast, and you know, uh, Northern big 10 schools, you know, Southeastern conference, a lot of people in pursuit and that offer sheet's going to grow. Let's take a look at what Jaden O'Neill has to offer out there, uh, with his huddle. We're going to take a look at it right now. Here we go. The first thing to me when I'm watching him, Josh, that jumps off that man, the dude can throw a deep ball and he can put it on the money. I mean, over and over again, he's just putting stuff in the basket and making it really easy for his wide receivers to catch. They're not having to make many adjustments to these balls as they're getting to the wide receiver here. Yeah, a couple of darts. Let's see this again going over the top. It's right on the money in the, in stride. Little receiver, go make a play on it. Little pressure, not, nothing too serious there. Flip it to the outside again. Another absolute dart on the money, and he can scoot. 
Yeah. And, and then as huddle gets to this pocket awareness thing, you know, obviously a kid with, you know, six, two, six, three size, you know, upward of 200 pounds, you're going to wonder how well he moves. And I like the way he moves. You know, he, he's a fluid athlete to me. He's not one of those that's like super bursty uh, is going to just blow you away. Like a Lamar Jackson with his speed, but he moves well and he moves well enough. But what I like to see, and you see it here in some of the huddle highlights, if you're watching with us on YouTube is that when he's climbing the pocket, when he's escaping the pocket or manipulating the pocket, he's still keeping his eyes downfield, looking to make the play with his arm. Obviously, he will escape and he will run, but he's looking to make the play with his arm. and He's trying to get his wide receivers the ball down the field. And as we always note on these highlight tapes, I mean, we're watching the good. They're, they, you know, they don't put the bad on the highlight tape. But what you do see from the the pocket awareness portion there is, yes, stepping up into the pocket, which is pivotal. And then on a couple of those plays, okay, I know where the safety valve is at, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that and that takes awareness. And and remember, this is a sophomore playing varsity football here, and he's showing the ability of somebody who could be a junior or senior, uh, from what I'm looking at. So this is a kid that. You know, not not rated everywhere just yet, but it's still very, very early in the 2026 recruiting class. Wow. But what you see is a player that's got a lot going for him already as a sophomore. He threw for over 2,400 yards, 30 touchdowns in 11 games uh, last year. And, I mean, Greg Biggins of 247 Sports called him the the best deep ball thrower on the West Coast. I think that that says a lot right there. And if he can continue to develop and and add to that arsenal, I mean, he's going to be one of those guys that contends for Elite 11 uh, by the time he's a senior in high school. Well, just physically, the way that he throws it, yes, looks uh, power four. Now, again, down to down, those kind of things, you, you always want, want to see and watch and evaluate more. But uh, in terms of just the, you know, general athleticism, I don't think there's any doubt that he's going to wind up as a three-star slash blue chip type guy. Like that move right there, going outside, buying time and just flipping it right that like that. Uh, yeah, that's that's big time. Nice little shimmy right there. Good move. Then look, this is this is nice mobility. Yeah, it's it's good, you know. And I know some people might cringe when I when I make this comparison, but it reminds me a little bit of Kayla Williams just the, the way that he kind of moves around, you know, has similar build. Um, you know, he's not Kyler where he's just, you know, so quick and so fast that he's just running away from people. He's not necessarily Jalen hurts where he's running over everybody or looking for contact, but he just runs well, you know, he just, he's just a good runner, um, and, and has the size to take on contact and good contact balance, but isn't necessarily going to overpower people uh, as a runner but i like i like what i'm seeing from this kid and you know if oklahoma can keep up the relationship and keep moving forward in the recruiting process i think there's a lot to to maybe look forward to as far as 2026 goes and and who knows if that'll be their quarterback for that cycle if they'll take one or two because we know that they're very high on darian coleman out of florida as well and he's very high on them so who knows where this is all going to end up, but it's a very, very intriguing quarterback prospect to say the least. No doubt. And one thing I like about the last couple of clips there is, uh, you know, on the one play, okay, I've got a, a throw option here. I've got a throw option there. Eh, don't really like either. Don't want to make the mistake. I'll tuck it. I run it. And he ends up, I think, picking up a first down on that. And then the other one, evaluate, evaluate, let the play develop, boom, flip it to the back of the end zone. I think this route's going to come open late. And sure enough, it does. So that's understanding the route concept, feeling the protection, and knowing, okay, I do have enough time to hang on to this football and then deliver it into the back of the end zone. So he clearly understands on – each of those two plays, this is the option as the play develops. I've got option one, I've got option two, and then boom, I'm going to take option three, which is run the ball. And then on the second play, it's let the route develop. Okay, there it is in the back of the end zone. That's that's some uh, pretty high IQ quarterbacking. Yeah, so you know he only completed 61% of his passes according to 247 Sports. But again, sophomore in high school playing varsity ball, potentially his first year as a starter, that's going to get better. He's going to continue to grow and he's going to, he's got accuracy. He's got good deep ball ability. And I expect him to be a, a legit consensus four star, if not five star by the time his uh, high school career is done coming up, man, we got some big news on the schedule 
aspect of this. Oklahoma's going to be playing a Friday night game to open the season. How do you feel about it, Josh? We'll talk about that coming up next here on Locked On Sooners. Hey, if you're looking to get in on the action, get in with game time. Man, there are so many great options for you right now. We got Oklahoma football tickets available already on game time. You want to get on, on some of that Friday night action? Go to game time. But look, on Friday this week, Oklahoma hosts the Milwaukee Bucks for as low as $19 through the game time app. You can also go see the Dallas Mavericks on Sunday for $39. Playoff tickets are already available to go see the Thunder, go see the Mavs. If you're a Dallas Mavs fan, like yours truly here, if I'm trying to check out a game, I'm going to use the game time app. And if I'm looking for last minute deals, there's no better place to do that than with game time. So go download the app in your app store. Go to gametime.co on your browser and you can get the best last minute tickets and lowest prices guaranteed. You get great uh, panoramic views from your seat in the app before you buy. So you're going to know exactly what you're looking at. And they got that lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you back 110% of the difference if you find a lower price somewhere else. And they've got great game day ticket coverage as well. Your, your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time, download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. But again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed over at game time. So the University of Oklahoma announced that they are going to be playing a Friday night game against the Temple Owls to open the season on August the 30th, moving that from what could have been an 11 a.m. or a 2.30 kick to a primetime 6, 6.30 kickoff on Friday. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about is this good? Is this bad? Is this evidence that Oklahoma is kind of mid? No, I don't think it's any of that, but I think what it is is the SEC ESPN approaching Joe Castiglione with an opportunity to put his team in prime time and get them out of that crazy Oklahoma late August heat that nobody wants to be a part of. Yeah, well, look, I've learned over the years that you're not going to totally change everybody's opinion if an opinion's made up. So if uh, if you're of the camp that this is a mid type move from Oklahoma, then chances are I'm not going to change your mind on that front. It's not, in my opinion. I don't look at it that way from Oklahoma. I look at it as, okay, you open the 2019 season at home on a Sunday night versus Houston for similar reasons, right, to have a standalone primetime affair. But that was a half decade ago. I, it's crazy to say, but 2019 was a half decade ago. So from where I'm sitting and how I feel about it, there's a strong argument to be made this year that it makes sense to do the standalone either on Friday or Sunday, not in a traditional Saturday kickoff time to get the primetime game. And the reason being, of course, is this is year one in the SEC. And so I, I think it's undeniable that Oklahoma will have more eyes on the football game and on its opener now because they've chosen to play the one day earlier in the primetime slot. So you got millions of more people watching this game than they would have watched it if it was at the same time as a bunch of other games on that opening week of the season. So from that standpoint, okay, now you're front and center. Everybody's talking about Oklahoma first year in the SEC. How are the Sooners going to do? What do you think? From a recruiting standpoint, from an exposure standpoint, now you're front and center from day one. If things go great the rest of the season beyond that, okay, well, Oklahoma's always in a position to pounce, but it's just that one extra degree of being able to have that exposure and being able to, to, to pounce and make something of it on the recruiting trail. So, and again, it's a once every half decade or decade. Now, if you do this every single season, then look, I get it. I, I'm not crazy about that either. But if you tell me that you do it on this first year going into the SEC and then we reconvene a decade from now and you're in a similar situation where you do it again, then to me, I don't have a big problem with it. I am sympathetic to the fans that, look, uh, they, they come from out of state. Uh, or they come from Tulsa, or they come from Wichita, and, and it's a it's a full 
you know, three hour trip or it's a couple hour journey to get to Norman and you're staying overnight and you got to get lodging. And oh, by the way, now it's on a Friday and I can't take off of work. I don't have the job to take off of work. So I get it. It inconveniences some and there's folks that they're not going to be able to go to the game. And that's not unfair grinching and moaning. That's that's a reasonable complaint for families and just for individuals that are season ticket holders. I hate that part of it, but the other equation of it, I do see the positives for Oklahoma. And from what I know about Oklahomans, though, they're pretty creative. If they want to get to that game, they're going to find a way to get to the game. And and that's not to diminish the the change in time and, and change. Okay, now you got to change how you request off. If, if you'd request it off Friday so that you can get to Norman early and then be there, Friday night and then wake up early and tailgate all day Saturday, then you got to maybe change that to leaving on Thursday. So yes, it does definitely change the plans and and changes some of the logistics for the fans that got to be a part of it. At the same time, it it, sometimes things change and and you kind of have to go with the flow a little bit. And this is going to be an opportunity for your program to kind of kick off the weekend a little bit. You know, you're not going to be at the Thursday night game because inevitably there will probably be a Thursday night game but you're going to be one of the first college football games that everybody watches that first week one. So that's huge. I mean, to, to have your team front and center, even if it's a Friday night, I think is going to be a a spectacle and you get a night game. That's what we wanted, right? Going to the sec is more primetime kicks. And hopefully this is just a sign of the creative scheduling that the sec will unveil to get a brand like Oklahoma in those primetime slots, you know, I'm, I like it, you know, for me now, it actually creates an opportunity where I might be able to go to this game because, uh, you know, a lot of times there's, there's soccer on Saturdays that I'm not able to, you know, take off cause I coach my daughter's soccer team. And so I'm not able to always take off and go to, you know, get to Norman to go watch a game, but maybe for Friday night I can get there and then I can come back, you know, late Saturday and, and, or late Friday night and then come back and be available for soccer on Saturday. So, you know, it does create some opportunities for other people who might not be available on a Saturday to get to Norman and go watch a game. Uh, so I don't know, it's a toss up by the way. And I get why people may, may not like it, but I, I think it's going to be a fun opportunity to see Jackson Arnold, uh, you know, in his first start as the, for real starter in 2024 and see what the rest of this, uh, this team is going to look like. One part of this team that I think is still a little bit questionable might be that offensive line. And we're going to talk about what do they got to do, man? There's, there's some things that got to get better uh, as Oklahoma wraps up the spring here in the next couple of weeks coming up next on locked on Sooners. Oh, it's the best time of the year. That's right. It's playoff time in the NBA and in the national hockey league baseballs in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Okay, well, if it's not the the best time of the year for you, it's one of the best times of the year. It's always a great time in sports, right? But right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic W, an automatic win. That's FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And again, some of those early numbers for the Oklahoma Sooners on the gridiron, nine and a half points they're getting as underdogs to Texas in the Red River Showdown. And seven and a half is that over-under win total for Oklahoma. If you like any of that, again, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number Number one sports book. So let me preface this by saying I have full trust in Bill Biedenboe and the Oklahoma Sooners offensive line group that they've collected this spring uh, to put together an offensive line that's going to be good enough to compete and contend in the SEC. But I will say, after watching some of the Oklahoma breakdown with you know Teddy Lehman and Gabe Eichert uh, from this weekend. I'm a little bit more concerned than maybe I was before. And some of that has to do maybe with some of the injuries that they're dealing with. You know, Jacob Sexton hasn't been fully available. You know, the, the injury to Troy Everett kind of thrust guys like Josh Bates and Gary and Hatchett into the center limelight, you know, Josh Isosa. Uh, So guys getting more reps at, you know, with that first team that maybe they weren't getting before 
And then, you know, right tackle doesn't seem very settled right now. It seems like the only positions that are pretty settled right now are, are left guard, Heath Ozida, right guard, Fabechi Wiwu, and the rest of it is kind of up in the air. I think everybody expects Jacob Sexton will be your starter at left tackle, but you got to have him available. He's got to be there. He's got to be able to play and, and be able to practice for you to feel good about that. So let's just say that I feel a little bit more concerned. And with the transfer portal window reopening here in a little bit, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Oklahoma goes and looks for a couple more options to add to that offensive line uh, competition. Now you've got veteran options in Michael Tarkin and Spencer Brown, but where are those guys at? It just doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of uh, answers right now at the tackle spots. So let me say this. First off, I love Gabe Eichard. And I find him to be highly entertaining. He was a great interview when he was a Sooner. He's one of my favorite guys to interview for Oklahoma. And uh, he, he, beyond Oklahoma football, I think he's an awesome analyst of sports. And he's a great fan of the Thunder. I, I like, I love Gabe Eichert. I, I, I dig Gabe Eichert. I like his content. Uh, having said that, and if I'm wrong on this, Gabe, jump in the comments or tweet me and uh, I'll stand corrected. And, okay, the last couple of data, seasons of data, Oklahoma's not been at that Joe Moore award-winning level, so you've had maybe reasons to feel this way. But I'm trying to think back. When was the last spring that Gabe was super excited about the offensive line in the spring? I feel like Gabe is rarely excited about the offensive line in the spring, and probably for good reason. So I would say, to me, I'm not going to totally hit the panic button, but we've been worried about the offensive line for Oklahoma. And if you haven't been worried about the offensive line for Oklahoma, then chances are you're probably in that eternal optimist category. It's the biggest question mark on this team. It's larger than Jackson Arnold at cornerback. It's larger than any defensive issue on this team. The biggest question is offensive line. How's it going to come together for OU? So uh, <laughs> that's a lot of thoughts to say that Gabe and Teddy are probably right on the money, but also I feel like Gabe is never one to just be like, hey, it looks great on the offensive line during the spring. So I don't know. Make of all of that what you will. Well, and maybe that's one of those things. Well, that's the position I played, so I'm a little bit more critical of it. But and, and you know, some of it was you know Teddy echoed some of what Gabe had to say, and I, I don't want to sit here and you know put words in their mouth. Feel free to go watch you know the Oklahoma breakdown from uh, April seventh uh, episode was what, what I was watching mostly because I was really curious to hear exactly what Teddy had to say about Jaden Jackson because you know Jaden Jackson hype train choo choo. Uh, but yeah, I was a little bit you know maybe stepping back in my optimism about the offensive line still feel good still feel confident that bill beatenbow will pull, pull it all together but man the spring game is going to be an intriguing watch especially for the offensive line because there's a good chance the defensive line shows up and shows out in that one and uh it might have us feeling a certain kind of way about the offensive line but you still got what eight and a half months to get your offensive line sorted. And I think that's plenty of time for a guy like Bill Biedenboe. Again, with the transfer portal opening, we know that they had a, a center on campus recently, I believe, an S from SMU. It wouldn't surprise me to see them go back out into the portal to look for potentially a, another tackle option. Uh, you hear Josh Pate of 247 Sports talk about it, and he says there are going to be some teams that are going to feel a certain kind of way about the transfer portal and NIL after the spring portal uh, opens again. So who knows what that means for Oklahoma in a good or a bad way, but uh, according to the rumblings he's hearing, this is going to be quite the transfer portal session in uh, post-spring. Yeah, that's interesting. We've kicked that subject around on the radio side. I don't know that you and I have a bunch. Maybe we have. It, it, sometimes these run together a little bit, and it's like, well, was that a dream, or did was it on this show or that show? But uh, I would say I'm going to believe it when I see it because I like. When have we had a truly chaotic transfer portal? spring season we've seen a, a couple of splash moves here or there but the way that josh pate and others are describing this spring portal season is like oh my goodness this is gonna be crazy and is it right. i mean like I, I gotta see that to believe it there might be one or two moves but are we talking about uh you know just to use the Caleb Williams example, I mean, Caleb Williams or this five-star recruit or that five-star signee, like if that happens, okay. But until it does, all right, uh, I, I'm going to need to see it to believe it. 
Is there somebody, is there anybody that loves college football as much as Josh Pate that also is a doomsdayer about college football as much as Josh Pate is? I, I don't know. I, I, I can't, I mean, it, it's, yeah, it, it's an interesting, it's interesting to listen to, to Josh, who again is great at what he does. He's a great analyst, has a lot of really uh, entertaining thoughts and, and entertaining content, but man, he, it's always, it's always bad. It's going to be the worst, except for, Hey, he is talking positively about Oklahoma heading into the sec. So we'll give him all that too. So it, it's going to be interesting. I mean, bear Alexander is already in the portal, which let me just put it on record. Not interested. I'm not, you know, Shayhan J. Roger, friend of the show from CBS sports laid it out that he's been a part of seven different schools dating back to high school in seven years, um, actually enrolled in one. And then didn't ever play for him before transferring out. So this is a dude that's got commitment problems to say the least ladies. If you're out there, be wary of Barry Alexander and his commitment issues. Um, I know he's going to land somewhere that's going to give him a big NIL package. I'm not interested in Oklahoma, you know, throwing their weight around to try and bring this kid in. I don't think Oklahoma needs him. I don't think so either. And honestly, I don't think that they're interested. Well, they probably shouldn't be, and and probably a number of programs are going to feel that way because, look, uh, from what you can typically gather, most any name image likeness contract is a one year contract, and then you know you you sort of reevaluate when the year is done, and there's outs really on both sides. The player has an out, the school has an out. You could terminate the contract tomorrow without really any sort of serious penalty one way or the other. And so all of that is to get to this point that probably a lot of schools are thinking, okay, there's only the one year commitment anyways, and you haven't really been committed to anybody. So why are we going to have any sort of financial commitment, even though there's all these outs and this and that, we just don't even want to mess with it. So I would imagine somebody will, right? Because somebody always does, but uh, Oklahoma didn't strike me as being the kind of program that would try and get in the business of that. No, he'll go to Texas or Miami and he'll, he'll get a big payday and, you know, probably play pretty well because he's a good player. It's just a matter of what will that do to that locker room and and will that kind of a move have a negative or positive effect? We'll see it. I mean, it certainly didn't help USC win any more games last year and their defense didn't necessarily look any better along the way. So who knows? And uh, again, this is not to completely slander a kid because again, he's a good talent. He's a talented player and NIL gives him the opportunity to make a little money off of his name, image and likeness. So he's going to just take advantage of that opportunity. But it sometimes there's there's moves you make and there's moves you don't make and sometimes the moves you don't make are better than the moves you make so we'll see what uh what transpires on that front but that's going to do it for today's episode of locked on sooners thanks so much for tuning in and being a part of the show subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts we're free and available on all podcast platforms and on youtube also go check out our uh, new national sports 24 7 streaming channel on youtube now it's also available on the Amazon Fire TV in the free t- Fire TV channels app. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref, myself at John9Williams. The show is at Locked On Sooners, but until next time, he's Josh. I'm John. Boomer Sooner.